Welcome to the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, episode number two. This is the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, where you'll hear about diverse career stories, career strategies, get tips, and learn from others to help you in your public health career journey. If you want to learn about public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories, stay tuned because you won't want to miss this. Today, we have a friend of mine who has more than seven years of experience of academic and practical experience in the field of behavioral and community health. She works as a health analyst at the Maryland Department of Health, graduating with her Master's of Public Health in the concentration of behavioral and community health. She also runs her own freelance business, Shelby Graves Freelance, where she offers tools to advance your professional career and create written pieces for companies trying to grow their readership. We have Shelby Graves, MPH, CHE, CHES. So the quote for today is, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you are right. And that's from Henry Ford. So just make sure that you're making actions and taking steps to get to where you want to go. So today I'd just like to welcome Shelby to the show. Awesome, thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, it's my pleasure to have you. Um, so this is start off. So how are you doing? Doing all right. Just been busy working, you know, public health. This is our time to shine. So <laughs> <laughs> That is absolutely true. And, and I definitely think public health has gotten into the spotlight, whether that's for good reasons or bad reasons, it's definitely in the spotlight right now. Yeah, exactly. So what have you been doing to uh, cope during these uncertain times? Um, actually, it's it's interesting because my day to day hasn't shifted as much as I believe that most people have. Um, I still go into the office about two days per week just because I'm working on a lot of projects that involve strategic direction. So we do have to come in for some things. And I've mm-hmm. also lent a hand on things like our uh, COVID community line just to pick up where we're a little overwhelmed. So my my days have been pretty similar, just really working. Uh, I am trying to look at things on the bright side and try to enjoy working from home with a pet and my partner and um, not having a two hour commute back and forth. So that's been kind of nice. So yeah. (laughs) Absolutely. So you usually have a two hour commute? Uh, It's an hour each way. Each way. Okay. So yeah. So I've been trying to get that extra exercise and reading in. um, (laughs) Or just, you know, laying around watching Game of Thrones for the 80th time, you know. Yeah, as, like you should, <laughs> as you should, as you should. That's awesome. That's great that you have a pet and a partner to keep you company during these times. Yes, so, yes. T- tell us a little bit about yourself. So I am originally from Oklahoma. I grew up in rural Oklahoma, the Southwest. And I moved from Oklahoma to Texas to pursue my MPH at the University of North Texas Health Science Center. Moved back to Oklahoma to work in my home uh, city, because mm-hmm. at that point it was, felt more like my hometown just because I went to school there. And then up and decided to move out to Maryland. So now I'm in Baltimore City. So um, been, been a few places. Um, and I, I work in public health as a health policy analyst, as you said, and have a background in health education. Okay, that's awesome. And yeah, it's always good to get around and check out new places. Yeah, so like what Alaska. does, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, definitely like Alaska, um, which is very interesting right now, like, because everything's basically opening back up right now. But yeah. we do not, we do not have like a huge amount of cases just because mm-hmm. it's a very contained population and we are far mm-hmm. from everything else. But it'll be interesting to see because when you go out, like 80 to 90% of the people I guess, think that there's no pandemic. They don't wear any mask. They don't do anything like that. So it's, it's really disheartening in some, some ways. So we will see how that goes. Yeah. Best of luck. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. So on the public health vein, what does public health mean to you? I always get asked that question. And I think that everyone kind of has their own answer. And I think that's a good thing because to me, public health can mean so many different things. So I try to keep it as simple as possible. And I just say, um, when I'm talking to people who are unfamiliar with it, that it is about making the world a healthier, happier, and safer place to be. 
So it really just encompasses so many disciplines and really anyone can contribute to public health. So that's my preferred way of describing it. Uh, I really like that way of describing it because it really just breaks it down to a really simple level. And I think if you do try to explain public health, it can get very complicated very quickly just because it's, it's a complicated thing to understand. Me, myself, I didn't know what public health was until I was maybe like two years ago, three years ago. So it is def- mm-hmm. it's definitely something. So yeah, tell me. Yeah, starting to get a rep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and hopefully it's a good one, and hopefully we get the recognition that we deserve going forward, and also the funding that we deserve going forward. I second that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, where does your public health journey begin? So, growing up in a rural area, I saw what can happen to areas that are a little more secluded and do not have the resources that larger areas, especially metropolis, uh, metropolis areas, I, like, uh, like to have. So I really just thought, you know, I want to do something to help people. And when I left my rural hometown to go to college, I thought, oh, that, that would mean getting a clinical degree. Because like so many people, I had no idea what public health was. So I started studying biology. And I I like it. I love science, so I enjoyed it, but it just didn't feel like my fit. So one semester, I decided, you know what, I'm just going to take a bunch of random classes. And I took classes in philosophy, psychology, and public health. And I had no idea what public health was. And one of my professors was up there talking about human development. And she actually went to the Kenzie Institute, and she was a, a sexologist. And so she was talking about making the, she was talking about applying sexology to people having happier and healthier relationships and how it related to public health. And I was like, what? Like, (laughs) what is that? Like, what is this? What are you talking about? So I stayed after and talked to her after class and I went directly to my advisor's uh, office and changed my major that day. Wow. That's an amazing experience. Like, I wonder if, if, yeah, I had a similar experience if I would have done the same thing because I was also a biology major undergrad. Oh, yeah. And then only after wanting to go into like the med school route and everything, things like kind of changed. And then I ended up in public health. And then I was like, oh, this is definitely a fit for me. So like maybe like I think people just need the, the exposure to the public health field. Yeah. And hopefully that's something that I can bring about with this sh- podcast. So we will see. Yeah, for sure. I definitely think that we need to get the word out because we need more more people in public health. I'm always advocating for more people to join. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So right after you completed your um, bachelor's, you got your CHES. Do you want to tell us what that is and why you decided to get that? Yeah, so C-H-E-S, or I just call it CHES for short because it's easier, (laughs) rolls off my tongue a little easier. Um, uh, It is uh, Community Health Education Specialist Certification. There's a a CHES and there's an M-CHES, which is a Master of CHES. And my school was SOFI accredited, Society of Public Health Education accredited. So they really, my undergraduate program really valued Um, and still continues to value the principles and the responsibilities of CHES. So that's a lot of assessment, program planning, advocating. So I definitely recommend it because I think that it pushes you um, into looking at things through a practice-based lens, and I think that it definitely does open up additional opportunities. I will say that every job interview I've ever had has asked about my CHES certification and gone into more detailed questions about it during an interview. So I definitely think that it makes a difference. Okay, thank you for letting me know that. Um, and that's definitely one of, one of the certifications that like I've been looking into thinking about getting. Um, during my MPH, we had the chance to get our CPH, but I, I guess, applied too late to get it for free through the school. So I was like, oh, I'm not going to pay to oh, do it. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. so... So and, and then just learning as I got out of the field, just how many people with their CPHs never found like much benefit from getting it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so is, is that the case yeah, with you same. too? Yeah, I my graduate school required that we take it and pass it, uh, actually. Um, and they paid for part of it, I believe. But I, yeah, I was, I was really, I don't want to speak badly about a certification I was just disappointed in it for me that it didn't give me anything extra professionally but now I am starting to see the CPH 
certifications available on webinars and things. So I think that maybe it's gaining some traction. I just at the time it was still pretty brand new. So I, I didn't feel as if I had as much value as I did with the time. Okay. And, and is that more on the side of like, it was tough to get credits for it, like continuing education credits? Yeah, it was difficult whenever it was, it was 2016 when I earned it and I had to really hunt down sort of CEUs for it. And with Chaz, they're, they're really everywhere. So um, I definitely think also the CPH really is just um, a testament that you got your MPH and that you really mastered the core things of the MPH. So, um, so I think it's, it's good. I, it just wasn't as popular at the time that I received the certification. Okay. And, and can you just touch on what those continuing education credits are about? Or how, um, how you go about getting them? Oh, for like, for the CHES or for the CPH? Yeah. Yeah, either um, So you can get them. There's usually different types of categories. For CHES, there's type 1 and type 2, and they just added a brand new type as well, um, which I just got a letter about the other day, and I need to read. So well, thanks for the reminder. <laughs> so whenever you see webinars offered by the CDC or by APHA, Sometimes they'll have CHES or CPH credits at the bottom, and so you can get them that way from a webinar, a live one, or a recorded one. You usually have to take an evaluation, and sometimes you do have to pay for those. It's like three dollars sometimes if you go through um, through like a, a smaller program. You can also get them from taking advanced courses online. So some of the people that have Instagrams and public health that are consultants will offer those um, on their website. And you can get them from working on projects that were published, manuscripts, uh, and going to conferences. So there's really a lot of different ways that you can get your certification, continuing education done. So it's pretty okay. great because it pushes you kind of to stay on top of your game and keep learning. Yeah, and that's definitely one thing, the one concept I like of getting a certification that you have to, you have to be forced to actively go out and seek these classes to continue your education and continue being a learner. So yeah. moving, moving on, I'd like to say that you uh, definitely amaze me in the amount of things that you did during like bachelor's and your master's program, like the amount of different like jobs or internships that you were involved in. So like mm -hmm. just to name a few, I know that you were a research assistant at University of Central Oklahoma. Then you, were, you worked at the Office of Health Promotion Intern for the Oklahoma Department of Health. You were a graduate research assistant and a graduate teaching assistant at the University of North Texas Science Center and a graduate public health intern at the Samaritan House. So those, those are definitely a lot of experiences. Like coming from where I came from, I, I definitely didn't have as much experience as you did. So I'm mm -hmm. kind of jealous of you, but, but I'm de oh, I no. def <laughs> but definitely so just, time. <laughs> yeah, and I know definitely. But just, just talk us through getting those experiences and what you learned and, and anything else you'd like to mention about those. So I was, so, so lucky. Um, my undergraduate degree um, really pushed field experience. Um, so they had partnerships with a lot of agencies, namely the Oklahoma State Department of Health and the Oklahoma City County Health Department. So they had a great relationship um, and they required us to do one practic practicum experience. So um, it's a, a shorter internship, our first semester of being a public health student, and they still do that. And then the last semester was a full long um, semester intensive internship experience. And then our coursework also involved a lot of volunteer opportunities. So we were really exposed to a lot of community partners and community stakeholders. And so it created a lot of opportunities for us to be able to do that. I don't know that I would have been able to make the time on my own, uh, working my, like myself through school to say, oh, let me just go volunteer for free for 500 hours this semester, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, but it was, it was really wonderful, so um, that was great, and then in grad school, we did have to complete an internship as well, and I wanted to be able to eat during grad school, so I became a researcher, <laughs> <laughs> so that was really nice. Um, I, I will say I learned the most through mentorship in my programs with some of these these people from my internship and uh, research assistantships, 
opportunities um, and some of my professors. And I also learned so much just getting my hands dirty in public health. I think that field experience is essential in learning. And so I always advocate for schools to build field experience into coursework and let their students get their hands dirty and let their class projects be real community projects because then you have it on your resume, of course, but you also have that experience to walk in and feel more confident whenever you're going out and actually practicing public health on your own. So, yeah, good experience. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And getting that experience is definitely needed, especially more so now than ever when it's, mm -hmm. it's hard to get into the field. And then there have just been a lot of like job cuts and nonprofits oh, are like difficult. very underfunded right now. So, so that experience is, is very necessary. But I'd just like to, to talk about the point that you said that your program offered you the time and that you were able to get this field experience. So definitely when you are looking into your bachelor's programs or master's programs, well, master's programs, more likely or not, you're going to have a part of it that is a practicum or an internship with your undergrad. Definitely just look and see what you can find and how it's going to give you value um, moving forward. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, more about the mentorship part of the, the experiences that you got from the people that you learned from? Yeah, I was really fortunate to have professors who were not just academics, not saying that being an academic is anything, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, <laughs> but they were not just academics, they were people who practiced in the field or had practiced in the field and then came back to academia for the most part, and they all had big hearts for public health and were very passionate about um, instilling that passion and that knowledge in their students, so I really gravitated toward um, I would say probably two, uh, two professors in particular during undergrad, and they were able to give me advice about the CHES. They were able to help me whenever I had frustrations with internship situations, not anything horrible, but just trying to manage certain situations. And I was able to become a research assistant because of one of those mentorships, because I was able to help write a, a grant. Um, and that led to being a research assistant. So I think that opening yourself up to your professors, to your advisors, or to even senior students and seeing what everyone's involved in and seeing where you can get involved in projects can lead to a lot of experience and a lot of mentorship that you're not going to get just from, uh, you know, the, the coursework or a, a part-time job. I think that really getting in and just finding out what people are passionate about and what they have working on because professors in public health especially always have a million projects going on so they can always use some hands on deck. Yeah and I completely agree with that and definitely have to just make sure you're being proactive and getting out there and showing that you want to do the work because a lot of the times people want to help you and especially if you're at the same university as them they, they want to help you like they, there's that that university like grounding that makes all of you the same you know so definitely mm -hmm. just be proactive and reach out and do that so you completed your bachelor's got your chess and then you wanted to pursue your master's of public health and why was did you like decide of this before you graduated or what, what was the process for that i think i i definitely knew i wanted to to go forward i i loved I had like a public health family in undergrad, so I wanted to continue that. And they said that it gets more intense in grad school, and it, it does. So, <laughs> so I was looking forward to that. And um, my professors pushed um, getting a master's whenever they said, you know, you can go get field experience and then get your master's. But if you want to get out of the way, get out of the way. You'll, you'll enjoy it now because you're in student mode. So I began looking at Masters of Science and Masters of Public Health programs, and the MPH is just what resonated with me the most. Okay. And is that more because you're doing more practical work as opposed to research? Yeah, I would. I think so. I'm. Um, I I love research. I still collaborate on research from time to time with uh, one of my best friends from grad school, but. I really wanted to go the practice based route. I knew it would be public health for life. So I thought, yeah, I might as well have the MPH too. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So did your program offer different concentrations? Like, mm -hmm. And why did you decide to choose behavioral and community health? Yeah, so 
my program offered at the time, they've restructured what they're offering um, now. Um, they turned to an institution model rather than what they were doing before, which um, I, it sounds like it's great too. So they had uh, behavioral and community health, which is more focused on lifestyle health, health theory, um, and like mental health and things like that. And then they had the traditional core, like health policy and management, epidemiology, environmental health, biostatistics. And my school was one of the only ones that also had maternal and child health. So I was really torn between maternal and child health or behavioral and community health. But behavioral and community health, I found out I could take my electives on maternal and child health <laughs> if I wanted to. So, um, and I would just have more flexibility. It would be a broader background. So that's why I went with that concentration. Okay. And yeah, that, that's a pretty similar story for me choosing my policy and management background just because they, are, they were given the, the option to do electives outside of the mm -hmm. policy and management. And I, I thought just the the high level that I learned and the management skills would be important just going forward. So I definitely, definitely. resonate with that. Yeah. yeah. I definitely think, um, I, I think if I ever had to give students advice on choosing, it would be to go with the one that's broader or more flexible, unless you absolutely know that you want to be an epidemiologist or something very specific. Um, and then just choose your electives wisely because you can really, you can, I, I know some students that chose di very different electives because they thought, oh, it'll be easy or, oh, it'll be an online class. And they just didn't have the same experience. Whenever you really choose those electives carefully, you can really shape, you know, shape your outcome of your academic track. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I agree with that 100%. And I would, I would say just because the elective that I took was like community assessments and something something mm -hmm. or the other and from that my teacher became my intern preceptor and then just everything that I learned there really helped me get my fellowship because I did a lot of like community health needs assessments so mm -hmm. I, I, I definitely oh, yeah. I definitely agree that that you need to pick electives that are actually going to help you and give you the skills that you're going to need to do the work that you want to do. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, before I move on to your graduation from your MPH, just talk a little bit about um, your teacher, graduate teaching assistant. Like, how did you get into that? What did you gain from that? Oh, my goodness. I was, I was so lucky. Um, I, <laughs> I was asked by another, another professor recommended me to the dean because there was a new professor coming on board at the school who had never taught one of our entry level classes. Um, it was behavioral and community health, kind of a 101 class. It was all behavioral health theory. So I didn't even know about it. I didn't know that there was a new teacher coming on. And I, to be honest, did not love that class <laughs> when I took it. But it was another professor recommended me to the dean um, to kind of help um, help with the new class load especially because there was going to be a new professor so they wanted somebody I guess that was going to be friendly and available um, as you would want but I really lucked out because she was an absolutely wonderful professor um, she stayed with the university for a while and just went to a new one so she actually ended up serving as one of my references for the job that I have now because I had such a wonderful time working with her um, so I I would just say, um, let, let your interests be known to professors. That was a lesson I learned. And then if you work on a project with a professor, show up and show your best work and they'll just recommend you for things <laughs> randomly. Um, if they know that you're interested in being op and open to op opportunities. Uh, but that, that position was interesting because I went on the other side of the classroom and I was then helping to grade things and review things. And I saw all the work that really is poured into academia um, from the professor's perspective. So grading quizzes and papers and giving feedback. And that was my first time um, formally giving feedback to people on papers. And we had a class of, I wanna say there's 67 students. So it was a really large intro class. So it was a lot of work, but it was really good experience. I won't say that I became good friends with those students because I created <laughs> their work. But, um, 
<laughs> they were good students. It's just, it's a, um, it's one of the classes that they really put you through the ringer on purpose. So it was, it was really difficult to be on the other end of it. I thought I, you know, I felt horrible. Yeah. But, but it was a good experience to have because it gave me insight into everything that goes into a, a good class. Okay. Yeah, that's awesome. D- did you find like a lot of difficulty switching from being a student to teaching students? I, I, I think the most difficulty was that the students had a problem with, <laughs> with me being a student <laughs> and then teaching them because I did get to do a couple pieces of lectures um, and I did get to help grade, which most, most um, GAs don't grade, but because there were so many papers and because I was a good writer um, the dean gave me permission I just couldn't see anyone's name so it was just it was you know a blind a blind grading process so also that wasn't so great because I was blind like I didn't know whose papers I was grading so it was kind of I felt I felt tough Um, so that I think that was my biggest challenge was that as a student I wanted to see everyone succeed but I also had a job to do to help help them to grow and it was one of the first things that really got me interested in professional development and how to give and receive feedback which is still something I will always be working on so yeah and I think that's a great skill to develop which Mm -hmm. wherever you are in your career or your life just giving and getting feedback and not taking it in the wrong way definitely definitely (laughs) So you graduated um, from your MPH in 2016, and then you moved back from, well, you moved from Texas back to Oklahoma. Did you line up that job before you graduated? What was the process like looking for jobs and applying and getting a job? Yeah, I wish that everyone's job process was like mine was that spring. I don't know what was in the air, what was going on in public health that spring. Uh, 2016, I was very lucky. <laughs> um, I started applying to jobs in Oklahoma City because I knew I'd be moving back. Um, I would say that February, I wanted to start early and luckily I'd had quite a bit of experience and quite a bit of experience with health education on the project side. So I was applying to health educator positions specifically and I received an offer for an interview on all but one of the jobs I applied to. And I accepted three of them, and I finished the full interview process with two of them, like the second interview. And I loved the two places that I interviewed with because it was both health education, um, and they were with partnering agencies. So I felt a little odd about that. Um, Eventually had to train with both of those agencies, too. (laughs) So that was was fun. Um, And I chose the Oklahoma City County Health Department. So I took finals the first week of May and graduation wasn't until the last week of May because they wait for the medical school to finish at that school as well. So I finished my finals and then that weekend I packed up and moved back to Oklahoma and I started working um, the next week and I did not go to my graduation. (laughs) So (laughs) I was really excited about starting my big girl job. So uh, very lucky. I was very lucky because that is not what the market is today at all and it wasn't what the market was when I moved out to Maryland either I was expecting it to be just as easy and I've gained a new appreciation for oh I gained a new appreciation two years ago for that so okay that's awesome well that's that's good that you had a a good um run in getting that job and you definitely got a lot of bites from different companies and you found one that matched with what you wanted to do so you were a teen pregnancy prevention specialist Mm -hmm. what what does that rule do so that is just a really fancy too many words way of saying (laughs) um, i was a sex educator so (laughs) i implemented evidence-based sexual health education um mostly compromised comprehensive. We had one evidence-based program that was abstinence-based, but that was for young kids that we did that with, um, and that's just because it was in Oklahoma, so we ha- had to have that available. So I partnered with, my team partnered with uh, different agencies to train in comprehensive sexual health education, um, EDPs, evidence-based programs. So we trained other agencies and other health educators across the state We even trained some community members um, from community organizations like um, the Boys and Girls Club and places like that. 
And then we went into the schools, the juvenile detention facilities, group homes, after school programs, and um, some other settings and implemented that education. And it was usually for an entire semester or it was over like a winter break or summer break. So we were with the students for a long, a long period of time. Um, so it was, it was really great. It was a lot of fun. It was um, definitely a job that I, I think was great to start out my public health career with. Okay, awesome. And just, just a question that I had. Did you get sex education when you were coming up in school in Oklahoma? Because I know from for like for me, I got I went to school in the Middle East and I was I was lucky enough to get sex education there. I can't remember if I got it when I was in Trinidad, but I know when I came to the US, like and I talked to people, no one had any sorts of sex education. It's kind of frightening, especially from a public health perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is, um, so that is one reason why I'm so passionate about sexual health education. And that's one reason, that's what I intended to do with my career. I intended to eventually write evidence-based programs and test evidence-based programs. Like I, that was what I wanted to do. And my role has evolved since then, but I was so passionate about it because I did not receive any form of sex education or healthy relationship education, anything of that nature. I mean, we did have one day, my junior year of high school, which is a little late for some people, um, I would say in a small town when people don't have a lot to do. Um, it was a little late for most people, but I grew up in a very um, conservative religious environment. So I was just so afraid of like anyone ever like touching me I was like oh my gosh no like people I was I had so many myths that I believed about relationships and about um, sexual health at that time so because it took so much growth once I became an adult to learn about those things I yeah I definitely am now a huge advocate uh, advocate for it because the United States does not have the sex ed that it needs yeah yeah it it is very sad to see it it's something that's so simple that can solve a lot of problems and yet it's it's it's, there's so much backlash and and things around but i will not get into that today (laughs) yeah no another another day another topic so i know i went i always go on a little tangent whenever somebody asks me about sex ed so i probably should have warned you about that (laughs) (laughs) that is fine maybe we can have you back on later to talk more about just sex ed I would love to, yeah. <laughs> Great. So tell me about, so you, after your teen pregnancy prevention specialist position, you moved to New York, is that correct? So I actually moved here to Maryland and mm-hmm. I completed a fellowship with a company based in New York. So I went to New York once a month for a year and I would be there anywhere from three days to the longest I was there was 21 days. Mm-hmm. So um, I moved here, uh, packed up moved here. Sometimes I was in D.C., sometimes I was in New York. I was in D.C. more so when I first moved here. Um, and I worked remotely. It was mostly part-time, too. So I would go, and I would go to events that I had to be at in person in New York. Um, and then I would go to D.C. for specific events. But the majority of my work was done remotely. Um, and so that was, I was a global health fellow. Um, and I was working with NGOs to try to get grant funding and to specifically work on tailoring sexual health education, human rights education, and gender empowerment modules to their population. So um, one was, uh, I tried to work on um, tailoring it to a refugee camp. Um, And then another one I worked with was the Stephan Midbridge Foundation in rural Nigeria. Okay, okay, that sounds like a very cool experience. Yeah, so I didn't move to New York. I was in New York a lot. I felt like I lived there, um, but I didn't, unfortunately. So. <laughs> yeah, and and then tell us about the next step. So from there into health policy analyst. So I knew that I was going to be looking for a job in Maryland when I moved out here. Luckily, the fellowship opportunity came up, and it kept me gone a lot. But I was still looking that whole time. So it took me. It was a like eleven months of looking for a job while doing that fellowship before I started my health policy analyst position full time. So um, I was really interested in working for a health department again. So I was looking at the county health departments and in Maryland, all ca- almost all county health department employees are state employees. So you have to go through the state system, which is a really long process. So 
when I was working as a global health fellow, I was developing more skills with strategic planning, grant writing, partnerships, presentations. And I was just trying to find something I could channel that into. And it worked out perfectly that um, a health policy analyst position opened up at my health department. So that's how I kind of swung in there. Okay, awesome. And what, what kind of stuff do you do on a day-to-day in your health policy analyst? And do, do, were you typically at home a couple of days a week before the pandemic? Or is that something new? I was home about one day a week before because they let us be pretty flexible. And since I have the longest commute, my boss is very flexible with us on that. So um, he, before it was an hour and a half and now it's just about 50 minutes. So it's not so bad now. But um, so I was working one day from home per week unless there was something going on that I needed to be in the office for that one day. Um, my job keeps me on my toes because I honestly don't have specific parameters. Um, so it makes it hard to define um, all that goes into our work. A lot of it is um, strategic development and strategic decision making and the background work that you don't really see, but you just see results from. So strategic planning, um, That's I say that because that's what I worked on all day today. So it keeps coming back into my head. Um, performance management, performance improvement, quality improvement, accreditation efforts with SAB, the National Public Health Accreditation Board, and CARF International, which who accredits behavioral health and mental health services in the United States and Canada. So it's really that background work of making sure that we're doing everything we need to do, we're in accordance with everything we need to be in accordance with, um, we're improving, we're growing, and introducing new, new programs. So most days I am in meetings with community partners and with internal partners. Um, I am writing a lot. So writing reports and writing community health improvement plans. Um, And this summer we're gearing up to start our next phase um, of our new community health needs assessment. So I'll be this summer mostly working on needs assessments. And then I also manage grants. So I'm also managing grant metrics. So it's kind of all over the place. A typical day for me is meeting, writing, team meeting, writing, uh, going out to meet community partners, and sometimes doing the fun stuff like focus groups with some of our, um, some of our participants in our program. Okay. That sounds like you do a lot of cool different things. Um, <laughs> what I wanted to ask was, hmm. So you spoke about a lot of great things that you work um, as a health policy analyst as. So I was just wondering, what, when you say you work on these programs, are these statewide programs? Are they non, non-profit programs that you're working on? Or what, what programs are you working on? So I'm a state employee. So sometimes we um, do things for the state, like the Quality Improvement Council for the state, and that would be applied kind of everywhere. But that's the rare occasion. Um, but I work, I'm a state employee that works for a county. So I'm working on countywide programs implemented by the health department and also helping out with some of our partnering programs as well. So we have some nonprofits and some community-based service agencies that partner with us. So we work jointly and collaboratively on a lot of things. For instance, we have a local health improvement coalition and that has private sector, nonprofit, health department, and our county government all involved. So sometimes we're working on joint efforts and we're just pitching in from our individual program perspective. And sometimes we're doing brand new things outside of our agency scope of work. Okay, okay, that is cool. So in your role, what do you, what would you say is the most exciting and the least exciting thing that you do? Um, I, I definitely think anytime there's two things that are most exciting for me and they kind of tie. So sorry. Um, <laughs> just gonna have to, gonna have to go with both. I think being in the community and getting community feedback from stakeholders and participants is probably my favorite thing to do. I love focus groups. I love meeting the participants. I love, for instance, there's a, um, grant that I wrote with my teammates, um, It'll be, oh my goodness, it's a little over a year ago, and we implemented this brand new program, and every time I get to go to that program and see families interacting in that space, because it's a place for 
for vulnerable families to come and get the resources they need and also just support. They have support groups, direct services, you know, the whole shebang. Anytime I can be in that space and think, oh my goodness, I put, I wrote this down on paper a year ago and like, here it is. I think that's probably the neatest thing is just seeing the difference that your background work can make in everyday people's lives. Um, or anytime that I'm in the process of doing that with partners. So whenever we're brainstorming and talking and saying, well, you have this service over here and we have this over here, how can we make them work together? I think those are my, my favorite things about um, my job right now. Um, oh, and least exciting. Um, <laughs> any, any government job you have, you will sit through hours and hours of meetings. <laughs> <laughs> of people talking and showing slides um and i and meetings are important because you get the feel for the room you get the feel for partners you make connections you learn new things but i have horrible adhd and do not like to sit still for long periods of time so whenever i'm in a room having multiple meetings I'm, it's not a very exciting day for me <laughs> I completely, I completely understand that. Yeah, yeah. Like this, this morning I had to sit through a meeting and I, I gave no inputs. I was there just, I, I don't know what my purpose was. But yeah, I definitely understand. Those yeah, kind some of days you're just you gotta check out a little, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that, to the best of us. Definitely, and and that must be very rewarding being able to work on the back end of a program and implement it and then see the the results of that and I think that's one thing as as public health professionals like definitely seeing the work that we're doing and how it's impacting the community and these individuals is is very important and it really makes us feel like our work is our work is 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 meaningful you know definitely because you can get really bogged down especially working um in a, a bureaucratic system like working for a government agency you can get really bogged down in the details and the the day-to-day -day grind and you know if you have marathon meeting days and then you could be you know not in the, in the best place and you just go visit a program or you go meet with some of your participants and it completely changes your perspective on things I think getting in touch with your community is so essential to staying kind of on fire in public health work yeah, thanks for adding that. So to change topics a little bit, so yeah. tell me a little bit about Shelby Graves Freelance. How did you get into that uh, and everything about it, I guess? So I've always loved writing. Um, I would write creatively, I like writing about health. And um, about three years ago, I just every once in a while would pick up a little bit of freelance write, writing work. I had a friend introduce me. Um, to a, a nonprofit company that wanted someone to write about children's mental and behavioral health and write about resources that are out there for parents. Um, and so I just kind of did that a little bit and I liked it and that company redesigned. So I, I stopped writing for them because they, they no longer have writers on staff. And I just kind of put it to bed while I was doing my health policy role. And then I realized that I really missed writing. So I decided to jump back into it and I got busy enough that I said oh goodness I should probably make a website um, I should probably <laughs> make this I should probably make this a real thing give it a brand give it some colors put my face on it and call it a day because I really do like keeping that creative aspect um, alive and I really do like working on projects that are public health related and health related, but not necessarily related to my day-to-day -day job. Like, even if I could be writing about that, it's a break from my regular work. So I just decided to go for it and it worked out okay so far. Yeah, yeah. definitely. So I had a question. So I, I, um, I met you through Instagram. So yeah. I, was, I was wondering if in your Instagram came before your Shelby Graves freelance or if Shelby Graves freelance came before the Instagram? Instagram came before Shelby Graves, Graves freelance. So I started the Instagram when I was doing my global health fellowship. I actually just, I started anonymously and I didn't invite any of my friends. So I like blocked all my friends <laughs> on it because I just wanted something creative, a creative outlet. And it was entirely just um, photos. It was 
photos um, of what I was eating in New York and DC, um, photos at the UN when I was going, and it was just an anonymous account. My face wasn't on it at all, um, and that's why it's still called Sh Seriously Shelves, just because I couldn't part with the name. Um, and then one of my friends found out about it, and she's like, what are you doing? Like, why, <laughs> like, why are you not telling us about this? So I completely changed gears because whenever I was, whenever I was in my um, health, my global health fellowship, I was also job searching. And I learned a lot about job searching from being on hiring panels before and from just working whenever I was working during undergrad and grad school. But I really learned my biggest lesson that year of being a fellow and trying to find my fit in public health. So then I just decided to start giving out professional tips. And then I was like, why am I not sharing this specifically for people in public health? So then I just kind of gradually changed it. And then I decided, I love writing. I have this Instagram. I might as well merge the two. And that's when I kind of took that step, next step forward and made it official. Yeah. Long story, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you for sharing. So hmm, who is your ideal customer for Shelby Graves Freelance? I think anyone who, for the professional development side, anyone who's just really struggling trying to find um, their fit or their place, whether it's public health or whether it's health science or even something completely unrelated. I also help a lot of writers since I'm a writer on their writing CVs. Um, anybody that just is really struggling and can't look at their resume or can't, can't go on another interview and just feel so uncomfortable again I wanted to have a place for those people to come and get some free tips and then if they want to engage in other services that are paid um, try to help them to grow as a professional a little more so anyone that's just really not in their best place with their their job searching right now yeah okay awesome thank you for sharing and I'll definitely put those uh, put that information in the show notes so I, w I was scrolling through your LinkedIn profile and I saw you worked on en vivo and SPSS yeah um, I don't know if you just want to touch on what those two things are and what they've done for you I don't know if you still use either of them um, I know I learned SPSS in my MPH program, but everything that I learned from it is basically gone, um, unfortunately, because I definitely think it, it is something that's important in the field. And it's something that I would like to try to get back that knowledge and that skill around. Yeah, so SPSS luckily is, to me, very intuitive um, as a user. I do not really use it very much for work anymore. The last time I used it for work was last summer. Um, so I'm not really using it so much anymore, but I used it enough during grad school um, and during undergrad. We used it was my first introduction to it, very light. Um, but that I think you can pick it up and kind of learn as you go again. So um, I, I would say it's, it's a very user friendly platform for data management. Um, if you're not a big stats person, I love data. I don't like stats. So <laughs> for me, SPSS is my happy medium. I've used staff before, and we had to train in staff and pass a staff comprehensive exam before graduating in grad school, and that was the bane of my existence, even though... <laughs> Even though I'm told by all my programming friends that it's not that hard, but I prom like I think it's so horrible. Um, so I definitely recommend if you want to get more creative with your data and you want to learn a program that makes you that feels a little more intuitive. I think SPSS kind of fits that need for a lot of public health professionals. Um, could be wrong. Maybe other people don't like it as much, but I enjoy it. And in vivo is a qualitative. Uh, qualitative program and I love qualitative I know I've mentioned focus groups several times but key informant interviews qualitative uh, data of any kind is really great with in vivo you can walk through and code everything I don't know if you've, if you've used it before but you can color code everything so maybe that's why I like it so much because it looks you know all colorful when you're done it, it makes qualitative data uh, a little easier for me at least. So I have not used it recently at work because I no longer have the program, um, but I would like to start using it again. Do enjoy yeah. it. Yeah, I think I, I, I got, um, I, 
I realized Envivo was a thing during the MPH program, the cohort before mine, when they were doing their presentations, a lot of them used it for doing their data research. Like they would pull data from Twitter or like Facebook groups. And that, that, yeah. just, that just blew my mind that they can do that and like isolate different like themes and words and different things like that. I was like, wow, that's, that's really powerful. And I really wanted yeah. to do something with it, but never got around to doing it. But yeah, thanks for sharing that information. Yeah definitely practice it and see like just with something random and see how you like it i think it's a lot of fun to use yeah i, I think i'll have too much fun with it <laughs> to be honest <Yeah. laughs> i used it um for my my graduate internship i did an evaluation and i did a series i did surveys but i also did a series of focus groups and i definitely wanted to kick myself for for doing it that way because i did so I, I let people talk for so long because I wanted to hear what they like, wanted to hear what they said, but then typing it all and encoding it all. I was like, why did they do this? But it, <laughs> it does make that it does make managing that data so much so much more pretty and easy. So okay, so definitely if you're looking into qualitative data, check out Envivo. So, what public health issue resonates most with you, and why? Um, I I really think that the root of all public health is social justice and the social determinants of health. So I won't choose that as my topic because I think that's part of everything. Um, <laughs> so aside from that, I would say, um, I would definitely say women's health and family health. I think that family health and development has been kind of my niche here in my current position, um, trying to develop programs like care coordination, peer recovery, um, wraparound service provision for families that are vulnerable just because I think that we need to really uh, look at the family structure in the U.S., whether that's a single mom, whether it's a like you know, nuclear family, we really, I think that families need more resources to have ha happier and healthier lives. So I think that's probably one of my favorite things to look at. Yeah, absolutely. And I was uh, watching a, a podcast interview the other day and with Andrew Yang, and he was talking about how the family structure is, is really broken. Like right now, I think it's 40% of, of children in the U.S. are being born to single mothers. And that, that statistic just, just blew my mind. And, and that really just shows that there, there is a, a lack of, of both the sex education and a, ho a whole holistic thing of things that that needs to be taken care of in order for for these issues to really be solved and i would i would disagree with you like if if you ask me what resonates with me i would say social determinants of health <laughs> so you can go as broad as you want because i definitely i definitely agree that is the root like social justice social determinants of health and just understanding that all these health issues come from something else basically mm -hmm. and all come from something in your life you know yeah, and that's one of the, I, I just did a family uh, health assessment in uh, in our county with our partners, and I structured it all on the social determinants of health, but through the family lens, because we were looking at which of our families have access to, trans like transportation is the number one barrier to services um, for our families in our county, and I think that's pretty consistent throughout the state and across the U.S. So just, you know, somebody doesn't have transportation or doesn't have money to, or doesn't have a stable enough job to be able to, um, you know, to make it to all their appointments um, because they don't have a reliable mode of transportation, things like that, just that undermine all the work that individuals in our communities and families in our communities are doing to try to live better lives. Like they can, work so hard but if they don't have those core things it's, it's really up to us to try to fix those systems so for sure yeah. social determinants yeah. of health always always <laughs> key <laughs> absolutely I'll, I'll answer. Yeah. I, I definitely agree with that so where would you like to see yourself in the future this is probably the most challenging question for me i um i love all areas of public health so much and I really am happy in the role that I'm in right now. So I would really just like to see where this experience takes me to work, work on system level issues. As long as I'm working on something system level um, in the future, I would, I would be really happy with that. 
Okay, well, that leaves a lot open and a lot of, of different opportunities that you can get into, which I think is very exciting. So what do you think can be done for public health to be known better in today's world? Wonderful question, because I think right now we are getting a lot of attention and it, time will tell whether that's good or bad. Um, I think a lot of people have the misconception that public health is clinical health too. So even with the pandemic, that's a little dangerous that this is the attention we're getting because it is so clinical in so many ways. Um, I think that if we advocate for more education in public health, uh, if we have more universities offering it, um, and then if we advocate even more so, public health is already partnering with every sector, but if we try to make our presence known in those partnerships and try to really shine light on the work that's being done and really shine light on the accomplishments that we've made um, and get younger people more interested and invested in public health, then I think that we can go a long way um, in the future. I think that we'll be in a different place because I don't like this comparison, but I, there's an article recently that said public health is like, like the ugly stepchild of, and I hate that compare, I hate that language so much, but of, of health, because we don't get attention usually unless it's bad, bad attention. And that was kind of what they were saying with somebody that doesn't get attention unless it's bad attention or gets left out and, you know, healthcare gets the main, the main lens. But I think every sector is public health. So if we just keep that, um, that momentum moving forward and we educate younger people about public health, I'd like to see where we end up. Yeah, abs absolutely. And is that uh, the article from Health Affairs? Yes. 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 Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I read that one. It, it resonated so much with me. It's like, I know, I know. It, it, is, it is tough. And, and that's definitely something that I have seen play out in the pandemic. Like in the news, at first it was like just healthcare workers, then it switched to like public health and and frontline workers and different things like that so just because mm -hmm. people really don't understand what public health is and it, it's kind of hard because there's a face for like a doctor there's a face for like a nurse but mm -hmm. but there's no one face for, for public health no that, that's something that's really something that we have to like try to overcome and really push it out there some way or another Definitely. And language is powerful yeah language is so powerful whenever we say this is public health we need to be like really strong in it. We, I, I like that campaign that this is public health campaign. It started to get some traction back when I was in grad school and I, it's still on Instagram, but I don't know if it's as popular as it was. I think that we really need to, you know, have a, have a, uh, maybe a mascot maybe we should get a mascot maybe that's what we need to do no? <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree i agree we, we need a couple of different mascots <laughs> a couple of mascots yeah, yeah. we'll get on that yeah public yeah. health 2021 mascots coming soon <laughs> i'm gonna leave someone else that job but yeah <laughs> <laughs> we just put it out in the atmosphere yeah Okay, so we are going to move on to the last section, the Furious Five. These are five questions that I'm going to ask every guest. So okay. question number one, what advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? Technical advice, get as much experience as you can, um, get a mentor, and even if you lack experience, always present yourself as professional and open to any, like, any new experiences. But on a personal note for professional development, I will pass along the best piece of advice I received that's helped me through my career from one of my professors, uh, Dr. Sunshine Callen, and that is, you are not the expert. Your community is your expert. So every situation you go into in public health and community health, you are impacting an entire population of people. And even if you are part of that community in some way you are not the expert your community is your experts you always need to listen to your community yeah I, lo I love that 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 definitely resonates because we have a certain perspective and and that might be a very drastically different perspective of what the community members are seeing and what they're needing so definitely having them as part of the conversation is important especially when we had a lot of 
bad public health and health research in the past that has just kind of used the populations without actually mm -hmm. trying to to use them and build that empowerment in there so that is definitely very important thanks for sharing that so if number two if you were talking to someone wanting to get into your position what advice would you give them I would tell them to get as much experience as possible with uh, presentations, data management, and community partnerships. And if they're in a position right now and there's any workforce development or any QI going on at work to get involved with those projects, um, I am working a team of three. I'm very lucky. I work with um, two very talented other women my age, um, and we have a PIO that we work with closely, all, so technically four, um, all really talented women, but each of us has a very different background. We, um, three of us have MCHs, but our backgrounds are completely different, and our experience leading up to this position were different, but it was mostly just willingness, openness to work, um, experience of some kind in public health that you can translate to uh, this role um, from a more strategic lens and from a more program lens um, and being able to present information and synthesize information was very important for all of us um, and we use those skills all the time. Okay thank you and that's very informative and that's something that I think any student can can use to really build like, presentations. That's something we do in in school, like um, data gathering, data management is something that we lay in report writing. So yeah, definitely. Thank you for. So number three, what's something you are working on improving in your life right now? Um, I think I am always trying to improve on learning to rest and learning to. <laughs> Um, engage in activities that um, allow me to kind of quiet my mind a little bit. And I think that that will help me professionally because if you are always consumed with the work 24 seven or with public health or the pandemic 24 seven, it's, it's not so great for you in the long run. So I'm constantly having to remind myself to uh, take time just for myself and it's an ongoing battle. <laughs> Yeah, and one that's absolutely necessary during a global pandemic. You take your time for yourself, mm -hmm. Shelby. <laughs> Thanks. So number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? A book, a podcast, or a show, or anything? Oh, goodness. Um, I, there's not like one book that's ever changed my life for public health, I think. I think getting as many different perspectives as possible is my recommendation. So try out the podcast for a couple episodes, try out book for a few chat, you know, try something until something resonates with you and then kind of go with that. Um, and as far as um, what that subject matter is, I think anything on social justice, anything on racial justice and things like segregation is really important for public health, anyone practicing public health. Because if you um, come from a rural Oklahoma area like me, you might not understand those lenses until you get in there um, and really dig deep and read memoirs and interact with, if you're not able to interact with people in the community yet at work, start reading, read people's stories. I think reading people's stories is very important. So I recommend getting a variety of perspectives, especially memoirs as well. Memoirs are really important. So. Okay, and that's that's very broad and very general, but <laughs> no, I, I like that a lot actually because that I haven't thought about that, but that is definitely something because it, the memoirs do capture people's perspective, what they were thinking of a situation, what they were doing, and that is history, and history definitely informs us of what to do moving forward. So For sure. I, I, I'll take that into consideration, and when I'm buying my next few books, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so the last question is, where can people connect with you? So you can find me on Instagram at seriously.shelves. That is my handle. And you can also find me at my website, shelbygravesfreelance.com. So pretty straightforward. Okay, great. Thank you. And I will link those in the show notes for anyone that is interested. Um, but yeah, this is the end of our interview. Thank you so much, Shelby. It has been a pleasure. Yeah. I yeah. Look forward to chatting sometime to soon. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for letting me ramble about public health. It's my favorite thing to talk about. So. <laughs> awesome. I hope we have a lot more conversations going forward. For sure. Definitely. Thank you. You're welcome. Enjoy the rest of your night. You too. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. 
so happy to have had Shelby on the show today. She really gave some great examples on what public health is, gave a simple definition for that, and gave some great tips on what students can do to get into a position as a health policy analyst. She really spoke to a lot of things, and I think her passion of social justice and social determinants of health definitely resonates with me and my passions, and I'll definitely be looking forward to connecting with her. So make sure you connect with her on Instagram and on LinkedIn, and check out her website. That being said, thank you for coming to today's show. Make sure that you subscribe and leave a comment. Let me know what I can do to improve this show. I really appreciate you logging in today. Have a great rest of your day.